Taking off in an airplane looks pretty easy. When you're watching professional pilots and sim streamers, you might even think it's trivial. But in reality, takeoffs and landings are where the majority of aviation accidents happen. And it's not all that different within a sim like DCS. Now I did cover the fundamentals of a takeoff in an earlier video, but I know there are some cases that weren't covered. That's what this video is for. We'll go over some common problems and how to fix them. So let's take a look at five common problems with takeoffs. The number one most common problem I see with people having trouble taking off in DCS is this scenario. It's an out of control spin into the ground. No matter how much they pull on the controls, they can't seem to get out of this death spiral. But it's not the spin that's the root of the problem, it's the stall that caused the spin. To be more specific, I'm in the condition where the aircraft's wing loses the ability to keep the plane airborne. In this video, we talked about how this happens when the angle of attack goes too high for the wing to generate lift. When we say angle of attack, we mean the angle of the air coming towards the wing. As an aircraft slows down, the wings generate less lift because of the slower airflow over them. So if the wings stay in the same position, then you'll gradually see the direction of oncoming airflow move downwards as speed decreases. When this angle gets too high, the airflow over the wing separates and we lose lift. Getting too slow during a takeoff is what causes this. Now in a modern fighter jet, you typically have a lot of power to compensate for this effect. So something like an F-15 or an F-16 can climb pretty steeply right off the runway without immediately stalling. But one place a new DCS pilot will see a post takeoff stall is in the TF-51 that comes for free with DCS. Since it's part of the free download, it's only natural that someone would want to take it for a spin, or quite literally if they stall it. It also happens to longtime DCS players who've grown accustomed to the power of jets and then jump into a propeller plane for the first time. Fighter jets have enough power to overcome a lack of skill on takeoff, but less powerful piston engines don't. When that takeoff stall happens, it's going to look like a spin. That's because stalls don't always happen evenly across the entire airframe. When there's an imbalance in lift, it causes a spin, and that imbalance will be made worse by the added torque from the propeller. That's why you see the spin always happening in the same direction in the TF-51. It's going to be in the opposite direction of the propeller spin. During this spin, the controls won't work the way you expect them to. Trying to counter it by pushing the stick in the opposite direction could even make it worse. If you've ever had the TF-51 spin and crash during takeoff, this is probably what happened. In a future video, we'll go over the exact mechanics behind the spin. But for today, the important thing to remember is that it's caused by the wings stalling. Since stalls happen when the angle of attack gets too high, we have a very simple remedy to the problem. Keep the angle of attack low. In practical terms, this means don't pull back on the stick too much during takeoff. Keep your climb really shallow until you've built up plenty of speed. Remember that there's a relationship between speed and angle of attack. As speed goes down, angle of attack will increase. So don't dump all your speed by climbing early. Just take your time and ease into the air. This way you won't stall and spin the plane. The same principle holds true in other aircraft. Pull back on the controls just enough to clear any obstacles. There's no need to rush your climb. Do it smoothly and take your time. This way you keep your angle of attack below the critical angle that causes a stall. Wind can also mess up your takeoff if you're not prepared for it. It does this in two ways. When it's blown across the runway, it'll turn the aircraft like a weather vane because of the tail. So the plane is going to be constantly trying to face into the wind. To counter this, use the rudder to correct for the wind. If you don't have rudder pedals, then just tap the rudder key as needed to keep the plane as close to the center of the runway as you can. Remember that the plane wants to turn into the wind, so you need to apply rudder away from the wind. But this is only one way the wind can mess up your takeoff. Let's look at reason number three for the other way. Wind also affects a plane when it's blowing down the length of the runway. That airflow works exactly the same as the airflow caused by the plane moving through the air. So if there's a 20 knot wind down the runway and the jet needs 120 knots to get airborne, then there will be enough airflow to take off when the aircraft is moving at only 100 knots relative to the ground. Of course, if that 20 knots is a tailwind, then it works the other way. The same plane would need to be moving at 140 knots now to generate enough lift. Or another way to look at it is that with the tailwind, the plane would need to use more runway to get airborne. This is why planes take off into the wind whenever possible. Use that free airflow to help you get into the air. Don't fight against it by taking off with the wind at your back. But that's not the only problem a tailwind causes. Airplanes are built to face into oncoming wind, just like a dart. If you've ever tried throwing a dart backwards, you'll see it tries to flip around so it's moving point first. The same thing happens in a plane. 
If you try to take off with the tailwind, you'll feel the effect of the plane trying to correct into the wind. It'll be a lot harder to keep it aligned with the runway center line than when you have a headwind that's helping you stay straight. Since runways always have two ends, you'll always have one direction that is getting more wind than the other. Unless, of course, there's either no wind or it's exactly 90 degrees off the center line. This is why it's common for airports to have multiple runways at different angles. You have a couple ways to find out which way the wind is blowing so you can avoid a tailwind. One is the built-in briefing, which you can access with left alt and B. The other way is to place a windsock object on the map. Make sure that the windsock is pointing in a favorable direction. Now let's look at a common problem, and that's having too much weight. This is a problem that's more likely to happen with the free Su-25 that comes with DCS. It's very easy to load up the plane with external stores. That extra weight requires more lift to get airborne. More lift means more airflow over the wings. In the end, you'll need more runway to get into the air with that extra weight. And if you're not careful, you could overrun the end of the runway if you get too heavy. In the real world, pilots do a set of calculations to figure out how much runway they'll use for their specific circumstances. This is called takeoff and landing data, or TOLD for short. These numbers aren't only about weight though. They also include other factors like wind, altitude, and temperature. Altitude and temperature are important for performance because they affect air density. Increases in altitude or temperature decrease air density. That means fewer air particles are available to generate lift, so more runway is needed to get airborne. To illustrate this point, let's look at our trainer with every pylon and the wingtips loaded and see how it performs in different conditions. Here we are at a sea level airport with a temperature of 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero Celsius. When I go to take off, my wheels are off the ground at 0.85 miles down the runway. Now let's try the same loadout at the Tonopah test range northwest of Las Vegas, which is over 5,500 feet above sea level. Today, the temperature is a toasty 120 Fahrenheit or about 49 Celsius. In the same exact configuration, my trainer got off the ground at 1.2 miles down the runway. That increase in temperature and altitude had a significant impact on my takeoff run. Or another way to think of it is this mnemonic. Hot, high, and heavy is harder. If you think you might not have enough runway, you can do two things that real world pilots also do. Lower the aircraft weight, or take off at a cooler time of day. Going through all the calculations to figure out told is probably too much for the average DCS player. But it's easy to remember that worst case scenario number of 1.2 miles for this trainer. As long as you're using a runway that is at least 1.2 miles long, you should be good. And as a bonus tip, make sure you're using the runway and not a taxiway for takeoff. Taxiways tend to be a lot shorter than runways. If you've ever seen a takeoff that looks like this, it's probably number five on our list and it's caused by using the wrong type of steering. There are different ways that aircraft use to steer while on the ground. It could be through a rotating nose wheel or tail wheel, or using differential braking of the main landing gear to turn the plane. These are all useful ways to steer at slower speeds. Once you start going fast on the runway, these steering effects will become more exaggerated and could lead to a takeoff that looks like this. Not only could this cause a crash, but it can also increase the length of runway you need to get airborne. So we switch to using the rudder for staying centered on the runway once the aircraft gets going fast. The exact speed where the changeover occurs varies depending on the airframe. For jets, this is typically around 70 knots. So in our trainer, you want to turn off nose wheel steering by the time you see 70 on the airspeed indicator. Doing that will make your takeoffs look a lot smoother, and we always want to be smooth as pilots. These are the five reasons I've seen for new DCS players having problems taking off. When you can't take off and you don't understand why, it can lead to frustration. So I hope this video will keep that from happening and let you get into the air to do some aerobatics. That'll be the subject of the next video in this series. We'll be exploring how vertical forces affect your plane's maneuvering in that one. So I hope to see you come back for that. And as always, thanks for watching.